So hello everybody, uh, my name is Daniel Hirschlag and today I'm going to be presenting my research on the Russian minority of Estonia between the years 1992 and 1993. Um, so I was attempting to answer this research question which was why did the Russian minority of Estonia engage in rebellion between 1992 and 1993 despite the presence of factors that should have made them very likely to engage in rebellion. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick overview of how this presentation is going to go. I'm going to provide some context regarding the situations of the Russians of Estonia, um, both historically and right up into the 90s. I'll then give a quick overview of the existing literature that seeks to explain why some ethnic minorities engage in rebellions while others do not. And then I will give a quick overview of the methodologies that I utilize um, to investigate this research question. Um, and then I will provide an overview of my findings and explain uh, the implications of my findings on the rest of the literature. Um, so just my two big things that I find, I had to reject my primary hypothesis, which was that the Russian uh, minority of Estonia did not rebel um, because, that their, because their political leaders um, engaged in reconciliatory and threat-reducing rhetoric. I found that they engaged in like, threat-invoking rhetoric and acted as instigators of conflict. Um, and then I also found evidence to suggest that um, a, uh, a minority's claim to homeland, um, that the territory they reside is theirs and historically has been their homeland, might be a necessary condition for a ethnic minority to engage in, rebe in rebellion. Um, so some, just some quick uh, background about uh, the Russians of Estonia. So this is where Estonia is in Europe, it's located in the Baltics, um, and this is Estonia itself. So uh, Estonia was effectively annexed by the Soviet Union um, after World War II. Uh, while Estonia was part of the Soviet Union, um, lots and lots of Russians immigrated both willingly and not willingly to Estonia, um, to the extent that um, by the time that Estonia gained its independence, um, between 30 and 40 percent of its total population was Russian. And in some regions, such as the Northeast, like in the Itavera region, this proportion was closer to 80 or 90 percent Russian. Um, when Estonia gained its independence, the Estonian government started to implement policies to reassert their national identity. So this was in the form of um, pretty restrictive citizenship laws about who was actually Estonian, um, laws about um, if you were not a citizen, having to register with the government, and laws surrounding the use of the Estonian language. Um, so, there's three, I identified three major schools of thought that kind of seek to explain why some minorities rebel and some do not. Um, the first is the structural theory. So these are um, really like structural components of a society. It can be um, discriminatory social hierarchies, it can be demographics, it can be geography that make a um, minority more or less likely to rebel. And this is the theories that really dominate the literature and it focuses on large and like studies like trying to establish correlation. Um, there is the security dilemma theories that basically posit that um, ethnic minorities will rebel to attain their own security. And then finally there is the leadership theories that like that, that argue that um, minorities will rebel or not rebel depending on the behavior and desires of their political leaders. Um, so in an investigation of the Russian minorities of Moldova's rebellion, this guy named Stuart Kaufman um, created a theory of ethnic rebellion and basically what he said was that if these nine factors are present, um, then a ethnic minority is very likely to rebel, but ultimately it comes down to the behavior of the, um, of the political leaders. So if all these nine factors can be present, but if the leaders engage in like, medical, uh, in like a threat reducing rhetoric instead of like acting as instigators of conflict, then conflict will not happen. So following from that, um, I hypothesized that because those nine factors um, were present in, among the Russian minority of Estonia, that the reason why the Russians did not rebel is because their um, political leaders engaged in threat um, reducing rhetoric. Um, so I utilized a process tracing uh, methodology to kind of pick apart um, the process to see how this rhetoric um, transferred into an action of the Russian minority. Um, and Kaufman didn't really articulate exactly how elites can manipulate a population. So I drew on the press indexing, on this, these two schools of thought called press indexing and uh, media framing to kind of explain how uh, elites can manipulate society. And basically what I, what I hypothesized 
was that the rhetoric of elites is mimicked by the press, and then that the press determines the sentiment of the people, and then that the, um, how threatened the people feel is their reaction. Um, so I expected to find the leaders engaged in um, reconciliatory, <coughs> reconciliatory rhetoric, and the press copied that, um, and that made the people feel less threatened, and that was ultimately why they did not rebel. Um, so to analyze um, both the rhetoric of political leaders, the rhetoric of the press, and general uh, popular sentiment, um, I used uh, contemporary newspaper articles. I drew on using three databases to access all of this. Um, and I ended up looking at between 200 and 300 articles to kind of get the general uh, gist of um, these variables. Um, so my findings. So I actually found the rhetoric of the political leaders didn't stay consistent. It kind of changed over time. But at no point was this rhetoric ever re reconciliatory or threat reducing. It was always um, kind of worrying. And it went from just going from uh, a rhetoric of concern to a rhetoric of insecurity to finally a rhetoric of existential threat. Um, the elites, um, by late 1993, were characterizing the Estonian government's policy, policies as a war of discrimination, as a pseudo-ethnic cleansing, and the um, age of rhetoric of that such. Um, however, and I did find that the rhetoric of the elites was picked up by the rhetoric of, uh, of, the, rhetoric of the press. Um, and that it had a big impact on the general perception of the people. Um, so the causal process that I put together um, kind of held, but the thing that was being transmitted through the process was not what I expected. Um, so I had to conclusively reject my hypothesis that the Russian minority did not rebel because of the political actions of the leaders. Um, that just wasn't true. Um, However, I did find evidence to support the importance of a homeland plan for ethnic rebellion. Um, so the majority of the Russians of Estonia immigrated to Estonia um, during, uh, in the mid 20th century. Um, they were either first or second immigrants. And when I was looking at statements and interviews with everyday Russians and like public opinion polling from the time, I found that there was a sentiment that the Russians felt that, that the land they inhabited wasn't theirs that uh, Russia was really their homeland and that even if the regions where they inhabited was 80 or 90 percent Russian, that it was still Estonian land. Um, and this is a factor that Kaufman really didn't talk about in his research. Um, he, kind of, he didn't talk about um, the importance of homeland or any of that. Um, and this is an important difference between the case of Moldova, of the Russian rebellion in Moldova and the Russian rebellion in um, Oh, the lack of Russian rebellion in Estonia is that the Russians in Moldova had been residing in that region for hundreds and hundreds of years and did feel that, that region was their homeland. Um, and so this factor is underexplored in the literature and I believe is worthy of further exploration. Um, so there were some limitations uh, to my research. Um, I am not a native Russian speaker, so I had to use translations for a lot of um, these newspapers. Um, I had to use a lot of newspapers that came from the Russian Federation and not local Russian press of Estonia. Um, none of that was digitized and accessible to me, so it would be nice in the future to have access to that. Um, also, although I found evidence by analyzing these 200 or 300 uh, newspaper articles, it was still a like, very qualitative um, analysis. It would be nice to get some statistical testing to see if there is indeed a more uh, a relationship between the rhetoric of the pre uh, rhetoric of elites. Uh, the rhetoric of the press and how that impacts um, public perceptions of a threat. Um, and I definitely think that the um, further investigations regarding the importance of a homeland claim as a prerequisite for rebellion is important um, in the future. Uh, that's what I got. Thank you.